Well, welcome everybody um, uh, to this breakout session on organisational change. Uh, we're here for about 90 minutes, I think, and th that time we're going to divide into three parts. The first hour or so uh, will be presentations from two companies and union representatives. That will leave us perhaps uh, about half an hour for a Q&A uh, to be uh, hosted by uh, Deputy President Anna Booth. So um, just a, a reminder, um, so if you've got questions for the Q&A, um, please uh, uh, type them into the Q&A section and uh, they will be, uh, we will attempt to answer them. Now today's speakers are all committed to the model of cooperative workplaces and are here to share their experiences. Uh, some great successes, but also some significant challenges. Uh, two companies, uh, Opal Fibre uh, Packaging and News Corp, and um, some uh, representatives uh, some, uh, uh, from the, and I'll say this once because I think it is important, the Automotive, Food, Metals, Engineering, Printing and Kindred Industries Union, of course known as the AMWU. So we're going to make a start with Opal Fibre Packaging and uh, on uh, to talk about that uh, is is uh, um, uh, a key a key figure from um, uh, and senior uh, member of Opal Fibre Packaging, uh, Chris Siner, as well from the AMWU, uh, Katrina Ford, the national organizer, and Lorraine Casson, the national secretary of the Print and Packaging Division. Uh, also on the line today um, uh, uh, to assist us uh, is um, Matthew Tassize, the site manager from Opal, and AMW delegates Ray Wynn, who's the head delegate at the Reevesby site, and Hassan Nassim, the deputy father of the chapel from the Brooklyn site. Also um, uh, available uh, to assist us is Mick Ball from the AMW, who's worked on both sites and they'll be able to, and available to answer some um, uh, important questions that I think uh, Anna will put to them in the Q&A session. I'll now ask uh, Chris, Katrina and Lorraine to turn on their screens and their microphones and, uh, and reflect on their experience at Opal. Thanks, Susan. Just Hi, Chris. Good morning, everybody. Hello, Katrina. Good morning. Good morning. Um, Lorraine, would you like to kick it off? Sure. Um, I thought it might be worth uh, Lorraine Casson, um, Assistant National Secretary for the Australian Manufacturing Workers Union, and I look after the print packaging sector and have done for um, uh, now 11 years nationally. So I thought it was worth um, perhaps just while we start with the Opal journey, starting off where it all happened. How did we come to talk about a cooperative uh, workforce and working together in 2013? And so what occurred in 2013 was a phone call from uh, President Ross to our National Secretary at the time, who was Paul Bastian, um, asking for him to attend a meeting at Fair Work in relation to the company at the time. Opal was then was Amcor and asked the, us to attend this meeting that was very urgent, um, that the CEO of Amcor wanted to meet at Fair Work um, to have a discussion. Obviously, this was completely out of the norm, had never occurred in our organisation before, and the National Secretary contacted myself, being the head of print packaging, and asked me to attend this meeting. So when we attended the meeting, we went with a bit of scepticism, not understanding why President Ross was asking us um, to just attend a, a meeting at Fair Work with no listing. Um, it was to be informal, was explained to us. Uh, it, it appeared that President Ross was in the dark about why the company at CEO level was asking for this meeting. We turned up to Fair Work um, to have the CEO and senior um, HR uh, with him. Uh, at the meeting where at the time he explained to us that the company was in financial dire straits, um, that there were serious financial matters, that the company had three choices in front of them, to shut, 
to sell or to offshore the business. Now, this is a company at the time that, and still does, had, a, had plants in every single state. We had 13 plants across the country, and we had um, uh, you know, hundreds of members, if not 1,100 members at the time, and up to, including white collar, could have been 1,800 employees in this business. Um, it came as a bit of a shock to us to hear this news from the company. Um, at the time, to put in a bit of context, we were uh, in a, situ a relationship where it was a very toxic relation environment between the union and, and the employer in terms of employees, union officials and our organisation and the company themselves. Um, we have a workforce there that was predominantly male, uh, 45, age, uh, 45 years up, um, long-term unionised workforce, well organised, organised nationally, have an active national delegate structure, um, rely heavily on our custom and practice over 20 plus years within this uh, uh, national company. Um, and in 2010, when we had our last bargain with the company uh, prior to the 2013 meeting, we'd had 22 full days in Sydney with 26 representatives from the union floor being the delegates, the company um, had to fly in on, a, on those occasions to be able to have negotiations that were the normal style of very aggressive, a log of claims, um, members willing to take action to endorse those claims, and the company likewise had a log of claims and were prepared to, if necessary, take whatever action they could to pursue their claims. So it was a very toxic environment. So at this meeting, obviously, the meeting was not a a cordial meeting from our perspective. It was quite aggressive um, and it seemed to us that the company thought they could just come along, have this discussion and expect the union to just go, okay, no problem. You're telling us that there's a problem here financially, so we should just do what? Um, and I think I was a little bit cheeky and might have said it in those terms. What do you expect from us? Um, and it was put to us, well, we expect you to go out and tell your workers that we need, we need to turn the business around. Um, and we need more flexibility from, from the workers. And so from my perspective, the first thing I said to the company is that proves to me you don't understand the union and our structures and how we work. Calling in two senior uh, officials doesn't change what happens in your workplace. We need to go out, we need to consult with our members. Our members need to actually understand financially where the business is at. Um, they're not gonna just accept this off car blank because the CEO says we're, we're struggling for money. They see the plants are full of work, they're working overtime, they're uh, getting you know, good incomes. What, why are they just gonna accept your word on this? So uh, from that point, we made an agreement out of that meeting that we, the union, had to go back to our members. The company had to go back and decide whether they could give us full transparency as much as possible around the financial situation so that we could actually have an informed and transparent discussion with our members um, about next steps and on whether our members were prepared to even step into an environment. And at that time, we didn't know what that environment was gonna be. We didn't have any, any tag, any name, any, any sort of uh, new approaches file. It was, are we prepared to step out of our comfort zone of our adversarial way of working with each other, um, that there's them and us, uh, that there's a winner and a loser in every, every way that we work with each other. Someone walks away as a winner and someone walks away as a loser and that can sometimes be the company and that can sometimes be um, our members uh, being the union members. And so we had to go out to our, our obviously delegates and we, we put a process to, to the CEO in that forum that was not a quick process, which is we're going to have to go to our senior delegates and have a meeting with them. We're going to, that means flying them into a meeting. Um, and of course, his natural reaction was, didn't you hear what I just said, Lorraine? We're in financial trouble and you're asking me to put money on the table to fly people together in Melbourne or Sydney to actually walk through the issue before you even go to your members. And I had to explain to him, well, unless we do that, it's money well spent. If we don't do that, we're not going to get buy-in from the members because we just turn up to a site saying, hey, the company says they're in trouble. Um, we have a well-established active delegate network and we need to respect that and you need to respect that. And we need to make sure that these delegates, first of all, hear from you directly and understand and actually support going down a process, whatever that process might be. Um, then they can take it back to their plants. They're going to have to individually have these discussions. That's not an easy thing to do in these plants um, with some of our militant members. 
and to be able to convince our members whether or not we should go down this path. And really, from my point of view, it was, if we can't even start at that point, we've got no hope. We're setting ourselves up for failure. We have to be inclusive with our senior delegates and we have to give them the respect to give them the opportunity to talk to you and understand what the process is gonna be from here moving on. The company needed to go away. They couldn't make the decision on the spot. They needed to go away. Um, they were hoping for a quick process. The company made that very clear to me on that day. We expected that this could be done and you could have a decision back to us in 24 hours. I said, no, it's not gonna happen that quick. This is gonna take a couple of weeks. And if we don't do the foundation right and go out and talk to our people and get our senior delegates on board, then there's no point in me sitting here and giving you false hope that there's any, any idea that we can move from where we are now and where we can be. And even myself in that environment, when I walked out with my national secretary, I wasn't, I wasn't convinced that this was gonna work. I wasn't convinced that the company were genuine, um, that how the hell, this is the most aggressive company we have in my industry, was my words to my national secretary. They lawyer up all the time. We're always in disputation. We'd had, I can't even tell you, in one year we had 22 hearings before fair work, somewhere that were not, not all necessarily arbitrations. But we spent a lot of money on lawyers on both sides of the company and the union. We always disputated the company right through the, to any changes they asked on any sites. Um, nothing was easy, ever easy for either side uh, in our relationship. It was always a very, very aggressive reaction from either side when there was any new announcements or from, from us or from the company. And so this was a process that we asked the company to give us the time to go out, talk to our people, and then the company's gonna to have to be prepared to be transparent and put some information together so that we could take that out to our people and then come back and have conversations with the senior parts of the company about, okay, so if people are prepared to go down this path, what does it actually look like? And what does this actually mean? And we all, recognize very quickly that we didn't have the skills independently on our own to be able to do this and that we were going to require assistance from fair work and possibly other assistance um, to get us down this path so at this point i might ask katrina who then got involved in the process moving forward and chris but certainly katrina to start from the union's perspective what are the steps that we took in that time period to even get our members on board to start having a conversation with the company about basically new approaches and different ways of operating and working together. Yep, thanks Lorraine. As Lorraine said, um, it was so important to get the foundation right. And part of getting the foundation right was the buy-in of all our members. And nationally that was around 900 members at the time. So. The first thing we did when we got the delegates on board was have a national vote. We're under a national enterprise agreement. So we had a national vote across all sites with all our members of whether or not they would endorse moving down this road. Um, we didn't have a name for it. New approaches hadn't been established yet, but it was in the process of being established. So we didn't actually have a name for it. Um, the national vote got up um, by a majority, there was one site that actually voted it down, but because we're a national union under a national enterprise agreement, um, it was endorsed nationally. So it was decided that we would start the process. We engaged um, an independent third party called COSOL, who um, was assisting in facilitating the meetings that we were going to set up and the training that was necessary um, to put in place for management and delegates on how to have a conversation in a collaborative interest-based way. Um, so once um, we got it up nationally, we set up at each site across Australia, what we called a site change team, which was equal representation of management and members from the floor, usually de delegates, but in some cases, depending on the site, they would nominate who would they, they would want on the site change team. And the purpose of the site change team was to jointly look at initiatives to improve productivity of the site. But it was also in the beginning around culture change because we had a very, um, we had a very, we had a workforce that was very militant and they weren't used to the union doing it this way they wondered why we weren't fighting. And 
we had to educate all our members on this new way that we were educating ourselves on at the same time as well. So it was difficult. And it was also difficult to get everyone to believe and trust in this process. Um, and that came down to relationships, which is a fundamental part of this process is relationships. And like um, we heard Natalie say earlier, it is better for a workforce to be organised and unionised and to be a collective because it helps drive change a lot more easier than the alternative. And companies need not be afraid of that. They should embrace that and utilise that in the way they're going to manage rolling out change. So we set up site change teams. Um, we had to go out to members and ask them for their input about the changes that were necessary to make. So we were basically um, telling our members that effectively they would have to work harder and faster for less money because it was going to affect their overtime. Um, and it wasn't an easy sell, but we got it across the line and we started the site change team meetings and we entered into our first enterprise agreement negotiation since entering into what we had then called a collaborative relationship. And as Lorraine said, the first, the 2010 enterprise agreement went on for nearly eight months, over 22 full day meetings with a complementary party of around 30 people. Um, it was costly, it was resource intensive, um, and it didn't necessarily resolve in the best outcome for both parties. In the 2013 Enterprise Agreement, we had the delegates present, Lorraine and myself, and we had the CEO and Chris Ziner, who was then head of the GM of HR of the fibre business. And we negotiated the agreement, I think, in two meetings. We took that out to our members. Part of the outcome of that meeting was a 0% increase which was a show of good faith on behalf of our members that they believed in what the company was telling them and they wanted to move ahead and work together in trying to resolve the issues that needed to be resolved to, to move forward. So as I said, it included a lot around culture change, but also initiatives on productivity measures. At the site change team meeting, the company presents data to the team and the data is very transparent and open. So from the very beginning, we said we needed to have that transparency and we needed to have that information to educate the site change team, therefore to educate the members. It was absolutely imperative that that was one of um, the redeeming qualities of going down this process. So we were seeking information to jointly work on projects to improve the company as opposed to seeking information to get, gather evidence for a dispute or litigation, which was what we would normally be doing. Um, Chris, maybe it's now time for you to um, jump in and give your experience of after we've set up the site change team in our first enterprise agreement. And, um, then we could probably jointly answer some questions with the help of our delegates and site manager. Thank you, Lorraine. Thank you, Katrina. And good morning, everybody. Um, I might just, uh, so certainly Katrina and Lorraine have, have laid the, the foundation of uh, how AMCOR became Aurora um, and, uh, and through that whole process, how we introduced the, you know, the model of consultation and collaboration under the new approaches file. Uh, a, a couple of positioning comments just to amplify uh, what Katrina and Lorraine have already covered. Uh, the, the first real step was to build a foundation of trust. I joined the organisation in late, very late 2012. Uh, and it was obvious, as Lorraine, I think, referred to it, it was a toxic environment um, and, and there was no trust. And the first, uh, I, I guess, show of trust that the organisation had to um, put uh, in front of uh, Lorraine and and her key stakeholders and Katrina uh, was very transparent financial information about how the organisation was going. In fact, we were 
we engaged a third party international consultancy firm um, uh, that, uh, look, if you've done any reading on our file, you know, you know its name. Um, and it was not their style to share uh, their findings of uh, how organ listed, particularly listed organisations were performing financially um, in front of anybody else other than the, the company board. Uh, you know, the organisation convinced that organisation to share as an independent third party reviewer, uh, the performance, uh, the financial performance of uh, Amcor at that time, or the fibre packaging division at that time, uh, with Lorraine Katrina and, and others. And I think that was the very first um, step in uh, building the initial foundations of trust uh, and building those, uh, you know, bridges of reconciliation and healing between the parties, um, all anchored in, in data. And that's one of the key principles that we've continued over the last nearly eight years in terms of openly sharing uh, with Lorraine, with Katrina, uh, with all of our delegates, um, uh, at an annual forum where we bring all of the, uh, what we refer to as the, the operational leaders forum. So all of our delegates and our site leaders together um, to share the, the financial performance of the organization, share the vision, share the, the strategy, uh, share customer insights um, and really provide as much information, probably more information than, uh, than we share more broadly across, across the organization. And that, and that continues and all of our data making uh, sort of all of our decision making processes are very much um, underpinned by by data. So if we turn to uh, you know the side change teams, um, they are the the cornerstone of what we try to achieve through through this process. They are site based. Uh, we attempt to empower our leaders, which is the site leaders and our, our delegates, uh, in the process of decision making around how do we improve. Uh, in a safe way, the productivity, profitability, and culture of the site. Um, we provide them with regular information, with regular data. Uh, we uh, have put in place uh, some infrastructure around suggested agendas, uh, suggested minute templates. So there is consistency and commonality. So again, we can learn from each site's experiences. Um, as Katrina and Lorraine have mentioned, we are a national uh, we have a national footprint. Currently, we have 11 manufacturing sites from Townsville to, to Perth and everything in between. Um, and we share those learnings as best as we can across, across the organisation. I guess the other important part to mention um, uh, as, as we're leading into this process through our negotiations in 2013, uh, we actually agreed a memorandum of understanding, which, which really underpinned this whole process. So, uh, optically, um, it, it was, a, you know, I guess a strategy to say the EBA is still there as the final layer of coverage protection of entitlements for our workers. Um, uh, as Katrina mentioned, uh, it used to be interpreted through you know, a very black letter law lens uh, and, and, and more often than not arbitrated through, through the Fair Work Commission. Uh, we agreed to, to put the agreement to one side, it's still there as the absolute safety net if everything went, uh, went, uh, went horribly wrong. Uh, but the MOU established this whole process of the collaborative consultative model uh, that we have today underpinned by um, the site change teams, which are the principal vehicle for us driving change across our sites in terms of productivity, uh, efficiency, safety, uh, and also cultural change um, at, at the workforce. Uh, sitting above that as part of the MOU, we set up a steering group. Uh, it was important that, again, we had a, a good governance structure, good oversight uh, over the work that our um, side change teams were doing. Uh, and it also provided a pathway for escalation if issues at a site uh, or more broadly across the, uh, the fibre network could not be resolved. And the steering group comprised Lorraine, Katrina, myself, uh, and the group general manager of... Uh, of, of the business. Uh, finally, uh, we received great support from Deputy President Booth and Commissioner Rowe in, uh, in the formative years before Commissioner Rowe re retired. Um, and, and I guess the important thing from, from our perspective is both Deputy President Booth and Commissioner Rowe uh, did not see this as a transaction. They actually um, 
uh, took time to get to know our business, took time to get to know both our employees and our leaders, um, took time to understand um, how we make money or how we attempt to make money as an organisation and what are the levers of change that, uh, that were required. Uh, and then that was obviously the final, um, I guess, point of escalation for us if, if again, the steering committee could not resolve uh, issues. And more often than not, uh, they were individual issues rather than collective issues. So uh, I think that the, the centre still worked quite well, but there were from time to time individual individual issues that needed uh, to be resolved. Um, so therefore, we then sought support from Deputy President Booth and Commissioner Rowe while while he was uh, uh, he was there um, through through that process as well. Uh, and that has held us in reasonably good stead um, over the last seven and a half years. Um, uh, I think if a measure of how many times have we been formally to the Commission is a measure of success of the program, uh, I think we can all collectively proudly say, you know, we've never, we haven't been there since, since we launched uh, this initiative in 2013. Um, the business continues to be, uh, you know, to be, I guess, on, a, on an improving trajectory. Um, now, having said that, COVID-19 and other things have, have caused us some, some glitches. Um, and I think the final piece goes to, to the relationship piece where uh, it, it is so critical that uh, data is important, structures is important, governance models are important, um, but uh, you know our business is the business of people at the end of the day as well and, and building those true, uh, hopefully authentic uh, relationships is what has made this process uh, you know, sustainable as best as it can be and ongoing as best as it can be. Uh, and it has also seen us navigate two quite significant changes um, since 2012. The first change uh, was when uh, Aurora was formed through the demerger of the fiber assets to form Aurora in 2013. And more recently in 2019, when uh, the, the, the same part of Aurora was sold to uh, Nippon Paper Industries to form now the Opal Group. Uh, again, through both of those transactions, uh, there were some significant hurdles we had to work through. Um, and I think it's fair to say, if it wasn't for the, the foundations we built in, in late 2012, early 13, um, uh, look, we would not be here today presenting to you uh, in, this, uh, in this way uh, on, uh, on Opal and its uh, predecessor companies. Thank you. Uh, it's also, Sorry, I was muted. Um, th there's been many positives. And as Chris said, and I'm, I know Lorraine will agree that we don't believe that either Opal, as it's called today, would be in Australian manufacturing, or at least it wouldn't have all the sites that it still does manufacturing in Australia if we hadn't have gone down the collaborative path. But that's not to say that it's not without its challenges. And it's not, you know, all all fun and games. It's quite resource intensive and it can be very emotional because you do have to develop relationships with people and you do have to give a part of yourself to the process. And it is a, it's, a, it's a personal learning curve as well because you're learning new things through the training, interest-based bargaining, um, listening skills. So there's a lot that you learn and they're, they're the positives. However, the challenges um, need to be addressed. And one of the biggest challenges we've had is, you know, the change in management and passing on the learnings of interest-based bargaining and, and how we can roll that through down to, to the members on the floor and to the first line of management, for example, because it is resource intensive and it is costly for the business to put the time and energy in to lay these foundations for it to be a success. And to get to that point, there has to be genuine commitment on both sides and the will to want to do that. And um, that that is a challenge in, in and of itself with a national organisation where you've got a lot of people that might not agree with entering into any sort of relationship with a union, for example, or it might not cover certain members that have their own personal agenda and it's hard to roll out change because we're trying to adapt and deal with, you know, um, 
I hate to say the word factions in this forum, but like little pockets of groups that, are, that have their own agenda. For example, they might want a redundancy, so they're not going to work hard to improve the company. Um, so we've got to deal as a union with the fallout and the emotions that come along with um, the changes that need to be implemented to move the factory along into, you know, 2020. And that's a hard message and it's a hard process to go through when you've got an ageing workforce that have been working in a certain way for 20 or 30 years. Um, and I will refer to one example, and we have the delegate from that site here, Ray, um, where that after seven and a half years and a lot of training and resources put into this site, um, I was surprised and I know Chris was surprised at how quickly both sides at that particular site fell back into their positional kind of adversarial mode um, after so much training at hand. And that was quite an emotional experience too. So. You know, the, the challenges um, are there and they'll continue to be there. And it's about how we deal with those challenges and how we keep the momentum moving forward. Um, we've got to learn to find a way where something like this isn't crisis driven. It needs, as the panelists were saying earlier, there needs to be a relationship and it's much better to develop that relationship if it isn't crisis driven. Um, and also, you know, one of the fundamental issues, as I've said before, is that the train, training people in the skills and rolling that down to every level of the organisation. Thank you. I think that means we've uh, uh, concluded our first uh, presentation. I'd really like to thank um, Lorraine, Katrina and Chris. Uh, I think they've touched on both perhaps uh, some of the challenges as well as the fantastic um, results that have happened with uh, what can never be taken away from this group, the number one file on, on new approaches uh, at the Commission. Uh, also, well, and I, I hope that we'll elaborate further with Anna um, with some questions with our um, um, uh, people um, who, who've been on the ground that, that I mentioned before. But now um, we're going to move on to um, the second uh, uh, presentation and uh, that, um, that involves what's happened at News Corp and perhaps I could uh, kindly ask um, Katrina and Chris to turn their um, videos off now because my understanding is we've got uh, Marcus Hook from News Corporation um, and um, uh, the CEO, um, uh, we're now going to talk about um, uh, the experience at News Corporation. So uh, thank you both. And so from News um, will be available to um, in the Q&A with Al. Over to you, Lorraine and Marcus. Thank you. Lorraine, did you want to start or shall I? Hi, Marcus. Um, I'm, more happy for you to, I'm more than happy for you to start. It's fine. Thank okay, you. thank you. Um, so the, the, the news story is, is largely similar to the, the Opal story. Um, and in fact, news was first entered into the new approaches file after um, the recommendation to meet with uh, Chris and Katrina and Lorraine um, and go through some of their experiences that they'd had um, with approaching a change in the workplace through new approaches. Um, my role at News encompasses uh, production, logistics and property. So I look after our print centres around the country. Um, I've been with News for, for almost 13 years now. And in, in those 13 years, um, we've had considerable change across all our print centres. Um, it, it is a, is a changing industry we're in. Um, when we first approach change in our business, um, our approach was to leave it to the, the last minute possible. Um, so, so keep the information very tight um, in a confined circle um, and then share it at the last, at the 11th hour. Now, the, the, the outcome of that was um, I had a very upset union who would be, um, 
and I think it was touched on before, the first response we typically get to any change we're making was, was um, we're in dispute or you know, the answer straight no, because largely we, we, we did the ambush approach. Um, and, and it was a conscious effort because we didn't want to engage early because we thought um, a, an open conversation with the union would get them better armed to prevent an outcome happening rather than um, you know, work with us to achieve a better outcome. So it was probably with a little bit of skepticism um, they ended the first meeting seven years ago with um, Chris and, and Commissioner Rowe, it was the time, and, and the AMW. Um, however, having listened to them, um, we, we made the decision that we, within news that we wanted to, to try this new approaches. And that was largely driven by the fact that at that stage, we were very early in the process of um, doing our planning for building a new print centre uh, in Melbourne. Um, and the 11th hour communication of a, of a change program you know, can't occur um, when you're building a new facility. So we, we, were, we had to do something differently. So after that, we decided that in our Victorian plant, um, you know, we would go down the new approaches file and, and we, we've done it differently at, at different sites. Um, I think Lorraine will probably touch on this a bit later. There hasn't been the same appetite amongst all sites as there has been in the Victorian site. Um, so we approached it um, and early on um, I got together with um, the union and, and our delegates on site and I had the conversation and it was very um, it was very interesting because it was at that stage it's a lot of ambiguity and I remember one of the delegates at the time um, talking to the group and saying just tell the plant even if you don't know just tell them um, so we started the communication we, we got everyone involved in, in, in the process and you know what was rumoured to be happening and was and was creating uncertainty, all of a sudden became a real conversation. That yes, we're looking at a project. Yes, it's not approved yet, uh, and yes, we're going to be working with you as as we go through it. Um, it is an uncomfortable position early on um, because it does take you out of your comfort zone. Um, for me, you know, someone who um, you know likes to plan to the the eighty percent um, and have it there to to start communicating when you don't have an approved plan. Um, you don't have a signed capital program and you're really dealing with a whole lot of ambiguity in a situation does um, introduce a lot of challenges on its own. Um, I think those challenges are from everyone. Um, in the early conversations we had um, with the delegates, I think they expected more answers than we had um, because it was an earlier conversation. But it has really changed our relationship in, in Victoria. Um, Probably a, a really good case in point, about five years ago, um, we went through one of the many change programs um, we had. And out of that change program, one of the delegates um, we determined was to be made redundant. Um, that sort of, pro after we'd made that sort of decision, historically, um, we would typically move on. Um, we'd go through a, a, a program of, of hearing out, the, out the, the, the argument put to us from the union, potentially put in dispute. Um, but there was very little avenue um, that would take us away from that decision. But at the time, Lorraine suggested we should probably put this into the new approaches file um, with uh, Commissioner Rowe. We did, um, and it was a much more diff different conversation than we would have historically had. So historically, um, we probably would have gone in, we would have listened and we would have walked out with, with the same outcome we were gonna have. But when you're confronted with a, a principle-based decision, um, and really looking at um, what's the common interest we're trying to get out of this, it opens your eye, opens your eyes to other alternatives. And at that point, um, the company decided to make the decision to reverse the outcome, um, which was a something we'd never done before, and something I don't think we would have done under the new approaches. Uh, and it enabled us to to actually ha have a much stronger relationship without losing anything that we might have thought we otherwise would have lost. Um, since then, we've continued the conversations, um, and, and Chris Zana touched on, on it before. Um, one of the important, really important things is the governance structure. At a site level, every now and then things will go wrong. Um, the conversations will get to a point where they'll go around in circles and it'll get escalated. Um, and yeah, that might get escalated, escalated to myself and Lorraine. Um, and again, we may or may not agree. We'll, we'll have the discussion. We'll try and work out what the common interest is. And at that point where it doesn't, 
we can have a informal conversation with Fair Work. And, and, and where that really changes the conversation, um, every time we've, we've gone to Fair Work to get some guidance, that, that's what the outcome has been as guidance. They, they've provided um, principles um, and common interest guidelines as opposed to an outcome. So it's actually sent us to go away and do the work ourselves. So the whole process has made the, the sites more dependent and efficient with each other. Um, because we're not going to the, the umpire in dispute um, when everything's gone uh, belly up. It's actually going to, to fair work to get some um, framework in, in which to re-engage a conversation to get back on track. And, and in all instances where we've done that, we, we've, we've managed um, to land back. I think the other telling point, um, you know, when I first started at, at News, our enterprise agreement negotiations um, weren't as lengthy as the ones that um, you know, openly AMW touched on before, but yeah, we'd be five or six months. Um, we'd start the process with logs of claims that were, were poles apart from each other. And yeah, we'd step in that process knowing that um, these are the ones we were gonna give on. Um, we, we'd, we'd have a long argument. It would cause angst in the workplace um, and we'd eventually land on something in the middle, um, damaging our relationship with um, potentially employees and, and the AMW on the way through. Um, four years ago, the negotiation we had then probably lasted six weeks and we started the process with logs of claim that were very similar to each other because we'd spent a lot more time getting to understand um, each other's businesses and, and what we were trying to achieve and really understanding what their common interest was. And it was a much more successful, a lot less angst um, and there wasn't the potential rebuilding you need to do after a, a disruptive, um, argumentative, adversarial negotiation. And probably the, the, the crowning point on that conversation is, um, you know, we, we do have a national enterprise agreement. Um, and at the moment, um, if COVID hadn't been hitting us, uh, probably from July onwards really, we would have been negotiating on a, on a new three-year agreement. Um, clearly with Victorian borders closed, we can't get people to Victoria, Victorians can't get out. Um, so Lorraine and I had a, a, a very straightforward conversation um, where we were able to make an offer. Uh, it was able to be taken to the members for, for a, a, um, to get us through to a point in the future when we'll be, be out of COVID. I don't think we ever would have achieved that outcome without a new approach as well or without the, um, again, the word that's been used a couple of times today, the strong relationship in play where over a long period of time, there's been a lot of trust developed um, where the company is able to have a conversation with the union. Um, the union is able to have a, com a conversation with the company, and you know we can make a sensible decision and move on. Particularly in trying times when there is uncertainty and ambiguity out there, and we we were able to very quickly come to a, an outcome and move forward. So I think there are a lot of very similar um, conversations uh, that we've had um, with the ones that we were touched on before that, that I went through. Um, it, it's really moved from that adversarial to a, a collaborative consultative approach. The conversation happens a lot earlier in the piece now. Um, it doesn't mean we agree. Um, there are still plenty of times when we, we disagree, but there's a framework for disagreeing. And, and, and even in that framework, when we do disagree, we, we, we can't get to a, a um, we, we can't see the point of common interest. Um, there is the safety net of, of having that informal conversation with well, now it's Deputy President Booth and, and, and prior to that, Commissioner Rowe to, to write us that framework or you know, point us back in the lines of, you know, these are the principles I see that really bring your common interest areas together. Um, the relationship's key. It's not easy. Um, it is a much greater investment of time, but it's a greater investment of time that is about having the discussion. Um, and I think you know, when I say it, it's not easy and it's a greater investment of time, if you go the other route, the investment is, is time is made in the recovery and the investment of time is made in, in the fight and, and having the dispute um, as opposed to having the investment time up front for how you, you get to the change you need to get to or how you resolve um, the issue that, that's arisen in front of you. So a, a lot of similarities. Thank you, Lorraine. Do you have any add-ons? Absolutely. Thank, thank you, Marcus. Um... Just um, from my point of view, uh, I'd had no involvement in this part of our sector, in the newspaper sector, until um, I started to get involved with News Corp, which was 
approximately eight years ago. Um, and it's only the Melbourne site that has actually formally gone under the new approaches, if you like, and collaboration. The other sites have sometimes been in it, sometimes not. And that's just a cultural issue that we sort of haven't been able to resolve even though we've got a national agreement. Um, but Melbourne certainly um, have uh, gone into the collaborative approach um, well and truly. Um, and what, where it started from in Melbourne was, I remember going along to many meetings and my officials going along to many meetings where they found they were going round and round in circles. And at each meeting, you know, we'd set up with an agenda of three items and we'd end up with 25 ad hoc, ad hoc items getting added on that apparently have been around for years, never been resolved, never got an answer. Things don't get resolved here, they just get put in the too hard bin. Or, and this was the perspective of my members, obviously, and my delegates, right? Um, and it was very frustrating for us and it was very frustrating for the company that we'd turn up to a meeting that we planned, we'd go for an hour, we'd go for three hours, um, and then there'd be frustration because the meeting was getting shut down because there were just all these things that just kept, kept coming out of the out of the woodwork. And, you know, and, and from my experience, it seemed to me there seemed to be a whole lot of underlying issues, a culture of not trust in the workplace, and things just didn't appear to get resolved. Because, and even though the company felt they'd resolved it two years ago and put that to bed, it's coming back up again. Um, we didn't seem to have this culture of being able to uh, get it out to the workplace because there's a lot of shifts. If you understand, people may not see us, see each other on a regular basis, and we didn't be out. We weren't communicating very well on the site. Um, so we decided, I actually decided that I'd ask Katrina to set herself some time aside as an industrial official for the union to actually go down to Melbourne to see if we could actually get, let's get all these things on the table. Let's get the list together, how big ugly it is. Let's get it together. Let's start ticking these items off. Let's get a proper agenda, put it up on the wall for everyone to see. These are the issues and this is where the issues are going and how we're resolving them to try and put it to bed. But as a part of that process, um, it became evident, obviously, within the newspaper sector, it's an ever-evolving sector, and particularly in recent times, uh, there was a need to discuss redundancies. And Katrina uh, raised with the company, as Marcus said, look, um, I think we need to get, and with all the other issues that are resolved, we need to get this support of the Commission here in terms of a new approaches file, which, as Marcus said, the company were prepared to have a look at and had a chat with obviously Opal and, and at the time was Aurora. Uh, Chris Siner and management spoke to management representatives about their experiences in terms of new approaches. It's something that they weren't aware of and it's always best to speak to like-minded people like unions have contacted me in recent years and we've given our warts and all but also our experiences in the new approaches. Um, and why we say it's it's a good thing and why you should always attempt it. Um, and you certainly do have to take the good with the bad. It's not a it's not a straightforward line. It's um, as Marcus has explained, it's it's a it's a harder way of doing business for a union official. Um, from our perspective, it's a lot easier to get in there and say, oh well, we'll just get the evidence and throw it over to the lawyers and go to the go to the courts or the commission, someone wins and someone loses. But it's a lot harder to actually involve yourself, and I think Katrina put it well before, emotionally attach yourself to getting to know the business and getting to understand the business and, and for our members to start to understand where, where things are going um, in terms uh, of the business. And as Marcus said, our real first experience at Melbourne was where we had this round of redundancies. There was a decision made around forced redundancies which if anyone is a union official and has ever dealt with them, I'm sure management has the same view, but from our perspective, it, it's always the worst position you ever want to be in where you're being told that someone is going to be forcibly uh, removed from the company. Um, and of course, that never goes down well. Uh, when that was uh, looked at, we also had the framework of the new approaches, as Marcus said, helping us with that process. And as was said by Marcus, we ended up with, um, a couple of those forced redundancies not occurring and quite different outcome. Uh, the company was still able to make the savings, um, but those people are still within the business now. Um, and we're able to show to our members and to our delegates, the process can work when we get to the table and we all look at what is the real issue here and not decide that and maybe it's a job that needs to go, perhaps we can redesign and do something a bit different um, rather than taking the job out. Um, not always the result, but in that case, that was the result. And that was with great assistance from obviously the commission, particularly at the time, um, Julia, Julius Rowe with obviously Vice President Booth assisting um, uh, us as well. Um, and so previous to this, what we would have had in the company, and I'm sure Marcus and his team won't take offense to this, was we had what we would think was like just 
disingenuous consultation. So we get a call 10 minutes before an announcement was going to be made to a shift about some change, whether it's we're going to go into shift, shift structure changes or redundancy rounds. Um, and so we'd have no officials on site to be able to help our members, assist our delegates, and they'd be confronted with this and there'd be all this sort of rumour and wildfire going through the sites. And by the time we actually got to management and got to talk about it, we had all this heated up anger and resentment from our members, which we would display to management as well, because we're only human and we take that all on board and we'd turn up pretty angry as well. Um, as Katrina says, you know, we take on a lot of the emotional baggage that comes with this. And of course, you know, management's human as well and they react to us in the same way. And for the reasons that Marcus has put, management just had a view, you don't want to forearm us, because forewarn us because we'll come armed and we'll have, we'll be ready to, to take you on. And we've now been able to get rid of all of that sort of old school, in my view, old school way of dealing with each other. And we can actually have the faith that we can put it on the table. And we have a process now that I believe and our delegates and our officials are on this um, Zoom and they'd be happy to answer anyone's questions around it. And here or outside of here, we're very open to talking to people about this to try and get the process as, as more hopefully user friendly as possible <clears throat> for employers and for, for unions, because it, it is a leap of faith when you go into this, you know, you, you, you don't have any guarantee. It's a leap of faith that could end up, you know, from management, you know, you could be having senior management saying, you know, what have you done? <laughs> this is crazy, right? You've given them all this and this information and power and now they're gonna run off and use it against you. And like, likewise for unions, um, one of the problems can be that the risk is that if the changes are not accepted by the members, the anger can be towards the union that you've gone soft. What have you done? You're working, you're too close to management now. So um, there are pros and cons in, in going down uh, this this relationship and this way of dealing with matters with each other. It, it does appear by our two presentations here that they're all crisis driven. They're not always crisis driven and it's actually better to embed this process in your workplace well before there's a crisis. Because when you try and do it on top of a crisis, which I've just had with another company recently, what you end up with is a lot of distrust um, and it can go pear-shaped on you very, very quickly. You need the time when it comes to new approaches and collaboration to cement the relationships and the communication from the top level right down to the bottom level of, of the workforce so that everyone's really comfortable. So when you do hit a crisis, there's that automatic way of dealing with each other. There's an automatic transparency. There's this automatic you know, way of rolling out the communication that members are familiar with it, that it's not something that we're just changing the way we're doing something now because there's this massive crisis and we have to deal with the crisis in a different way. It just happened to be that way in the ANCOR example, just given previously. And with news, it wasn't necessarily a crisis. It was just that we identified that there was all this baggage and we couldn't quite get rid of it or put a tag on it or finish it out or close anything out. Everything just kept re reopening up every couple of years and coming to the surface. Put in context with Melbourne, we went into this process, as Marcus said, about um, some ways that we've been dealing with each other in the past. It was also even more difficult at Melbourne because we had a small section of workers that weren't in the production area that were with um, a different part of our union and other unions and they weren't part of collaboration. And in fact, they were on the sidelines, if you like, undermining collaboration, saying that um, we were weak, that this was a, a, you know, this was selling out workers. This, you know, this would not result in a better outcome. Um, and there was a whole lot of, lot of headaches on site, a lot of double handling, in my view, because of that. But in some ways, it's been a good thing because that group of workers are now well and truly. Um, part of the collaboration. They're well and truly happy with the process. And in fact, they also would say openly, the information they receive now is transparent and a lot more than what they would have got previously. And so they can make an informed decision and they can go out and talk to their, their members that they represent um, around those informed decisions. So for me, that was a test that showed for itself how well it worked and we had to with our delegates we had to lead them through to just say keep on the path it wasn't easy because they get distracted by this white noise on the side um, and obviously that would leak into some areas of the production area which was you know a lot more people as i said and a lot of different shifts where people would say well we're hearing you're doing this there's all these closed off meetings there's these private deals going on 
And we just had to make sure that we had the processes to be able to be as transparent as possible with our membership um, that we were representing out there. Uh, and to show that working with management doesn't necessarily mean that you're not representing the workers. You just need to be transparent with your communication. You need to make sure that you've, you've set up the right processes that everyone gets a say and understands what's going on. Um, and you can put forward the, the difficult questions. And I think Marcus is right. We don't always agree. We don't always come out with the same solution. But then what we do is we say, if we don't agree, we have to find a solution. So it's about the process more than we're, how we're going to get to the outcome. It's about the process. How do we get there? How do we put all the cards on the table? And how do we find the best result that works for the business and, and the workers in the business? And so from my perspective, um, the effort we put into disputation in my 22 years as a union official, and we put a lot of effort into it at times, um, at the, both the employer and the, and the union level, if we put that effort into collaboration, uh, then we would be light years ahead of ourselves that we are now. And we're still, we're still trundling along. And I'm sure we've got a, you know, in eight years time, I hope that we can all follow up on this and um, see how far we've come along uh, in terms of our, of our collaboration. But one of the most important facts, as Marcus said, it's really good to be able to, if you need to, pick up the phone and have an off record with someone that's been assigned to you from the Fair Work Commission to just get some guidance on, on how we should approach this. And sometimes it's simply, do you think we should all just come before you and just have, have a discussion about this? Or is there another way of dealing with it? Because we all get embedded in our day-to-day -day work. Um, sometimes you just need that independent, fresh eyes to perhaps pop in a few different ideas and that's worked really well for us um, from our perspective. So I'm, I'm more than happy to um, leave my comments there in terms of the Melbourne Print Centre um, and we have, as we say, management and an official on, on here and I'd really like them to be able to answer some questions that may be put to them as well. So I'll leave my comments there, thanks. Thank you uh, to both of you. Um, and I think at this point, having heard from um, uh, Katrina as well and, and Chris, the, the idea now is that we move into uh, the Q&A session um, uh, and I'll hand over to Anna. But I very much do want to thank the, thank the four speakers that have Speakers, um, and over to you, Anna. Thank you, Susan, very much. And uh, thank you, Susan. And so good to, to see uh, Chris and Marcus and Lorraine and Katrina on the screen. Um, I'm now going to ask. Going to crowd our screen for you, our audience. Uh, we hope you don't mind that there'll be lots of us. Um, I'd like you to stay on, Katrina and Marcus and uh, and Lorraine and Chris. Chris, turn on yours. And also, I'd like to invite Catherine, who is the site leader for the Melbourne Print Centre. I'd like to invite Mick Bull, who's the uh, AMW organiser uh, with coverage not only for uh, the um, news site, uh, but also uh, for uh, Opal. Um, and uh, Ray and Hassan. Ray from Reevesby, um, uh, who is, uh, as uh, Katrina mentioned, in the Opal group, Hassan uh, from the Brooklyn site, and Matthew Trezise, the site leader for the Brooklyn site of Opal. So we've got a, a real crowd here, uh, but let's uh, see all your faces if we can. Um, I think the one thing we're all learning through our Zoom uh, world, uh, our, our new COVID way of communicating is that we, uh, uh, we are dependent upon the internet. I'm not seeing too many. I've just found Ray. That's fantastic. Hi, Ray. Anna, Mick, how are you? Um, very well. Mick, uh, nice to see you again. It was only yesterday morning. Uh, Mick, can you turn your camera on and take your um, microphone off mute, please? And you too, Hassan, and you too, Matthew. Hi, Mick. G'day. Oh, just now, and there's Matthew, hello, and Hassan. We're just Hi. waiting for you. So we see... Um, Hi, Anna. Ah, maybe we're just going to hear from you, Hassan. That's the, the... Anna, there you are. Fantastic. I hope everybody else can see what I can see part of the, uh, the, uh, the challenge. So um, what we've got here, of course, is people who are really close to the ground. And believe me, in my experience, uh, working uh, with the cooperative approach, uh, we, 
the, uh, the closer to the ground you get, if I may say such a word uh, on, uh, on the, the broadcast media. Um, Marcus, you're an expert in this. Uh, perhaps uh, this is unwise, but I'm going to say it. You get less bullshit uh, the closer you get to the people. Uh, and Catherine's nodding. Uh, good, to, good to see you. Excuse my language. Um, so I wonder if I could just first of all turn, uh, before we go to the questions from the audience, there are a few, but to Catherine and Nick, what you're going through at the Prince Centre in Melbourne is, um, you know, partly what um, might occur in any organisation that decides to shift location, but you're doing it in the context of a long-term structural change, which is the effect of digitalisation on the printing of newspapers, and you're also doing it in the midst of COVID crisis. And you've emblematically um, demonstrating that, Catherine, with your mask, um, as they say on CNN, it's a mask. Uh, but I wonder whether Catherine, you and Mick, and you can choose how you do this, is just give us a bit of an insight into whether the framework um, of collaboration um, has assisted you, you think, in this particular time at the Melbourne Print Centre, and if so, how? And by all means, as Katrina always says, tell the warts and all. So firstly, maybe Katrina, and then a, a, a follow-up from Mick. Yeah, Catherine first. Oh, sorry, I said Katrina, I'm looking at the screen and the K just got me. Catherine, of course, I mean Catherine. Thank you, Mick. So we're not hearing you, Catherine. This is uh, unfortunate. Um, not being the technical expert, but Jess is there in the background from Macquarie University. Jess, can you uh, give us a hint about how Catherine can be heard? Oh, whether it's... It might just be me not hearing Catherine. Is yeah. that right? Let's 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 hear from Mick if you don't mind, Catherine. We'll get Jess uh, in the background through the chat to uh, to give you a hand there with the audio. Okay. So yeah, Mick, thanks, tell Anna. us your experience. Thanks, Anna. I've probably got eight very quick points, seven quick points that I wanted to go through. The first important point is that for for the consultation stuff or the collaboration stuff, the people from the union have to be elected from the shop floor so that they've actually got the respect of the members themselves and not appointed from management. I think that's a very crucial point. Um, the second part is that, as Chris Weiner mentioned, the EA needs to be the basis of all discussion um, because we have to work through a document and the EA is basically the document that sets the guidelines. The meetings must be clear, um, must have a clear agenda and a time limit um, for them to be effective, usually one and a half hours with both Opal and HWT or News Corp. Um, the importance of subcommittees, subcommittees are committees that we can put off uh, issues to, defer issues to, things like pay issues and so forth, so that they don't clog up the collaboration meeting itself. Then, of course, the subcommittee needs to report back to the collaboration committee, which it does. Um, we also have a, with HWT, we have a caucus that goes for about half an hour before the main meeting with management so that we can um, work out our additions to the agenda and also set our own questions so that we're precise at the meeting and we don't end up being a rabble. Um, and that's a very important caucus for us to have. Um, the sixth point is that um, communications to the shop floor, they've got to be effective, they've got to have proper minutes so that the members can understand what we're discussing at the meeting. We also have toolbox meetings, which then, which management um, leads the discussion with. And then after that meeting, the delegates themselves speak with the members to see if there's any questions that the members didn't want to raise in front of management. Those meetings get fed back into the collaboration meeting. And then the final point is that if we still can't reach agreement, as Chris Ziner mentioned, then it goes off to a national steering committee. And then if that still doesn't work, then in turn it goes off to fair work and we come out with a resolution through fair work. Um, one of the important things with disagreement is that we are, um, are fine if management goes and tries and sells 
their wrangle of the disagreement to the members, but it's got to be management that sells that disagreement. It can't afford to be us selling, trying to sell a position that we don't agree with. And so then in turn, um, if the members still don't agree, then we go through the process of the steering committee and then off to fair work. They're the seven points that I think are very crucial for the collaboration, to make the collaboration committee work, both being effective, both, both for it to be effective from both sides, but also for the collaboration to be sincere and fair dinkum, to be honest, at the end of the day. I don't think that they can operate with any, with, by bypassing any of those seven key issues. Um, and that's the way I figure that we've been able to um, have proper consultation and collaboration through that process. I'll leave it at that, thanks. Hopefully I've resolved the microphone issues. Can you, uh, let's, let's have you put your perspective. Yes, thank you. Uh, hopefully I've resolved the microphone issues and you can hear me now. Yeah, we, you have, you, we have it all. You're a little bit frozen, but that just might be my internet. Uh, so let's just plough on. Okay. Find our approaches. We persevere. <laughs> we do, and I think that that's a really good segue. And echoing the comments from uh, all of the speakers to this point, it is hard work. It takes a lot of effort. It takes a lot of commitment and discipline to, to get it right. Um, and I think our biggest learning as a collective is that we don't always get it right. Uh, and the need to um, support each other when, when we do fail and, and when we do slip up and, and being able to check in and, and have a health check um, to get us back on the path, but remaining committed to the process, I think is the most important learning that we've had. Uh, but certainly it's around having structures in place uh, to enable success. So, you know, transparency is something that we've heard a lot from speakers and and we found coming from a low trust base that we achieved transparency through having uh, minutes that were really publicly um, taken and, and, and posted around the site. And that addressed the issues about, oh, what are they doing in there behind those closed doors? What deals are they making together? By having really transparent minutes um, that were very reflective of the conversations that had, had occurred, we found that we could address those challenges um, around what is going on. Uh, and I think the biggest learning for me, it, it, it's hard work and um, it's certainly a change in style and, and you have to keep it at front of mind um, that you don't have all the answers. Uh, and it's just about remembering that the more people that you open up into, into the problem solving phase, the more alternatives that you get on the table. And, and we've seen the proof that you end up with better outcomes by opening it up to everybody that's affected and involved in the change. Uh, that's, and that's where we've been able to achieve success is because success breeds success. Once you go through one change and, and you get good outcomes and people feel that it's gone well, that encourages participation in the next one and the next one. And, and sitting here at a point where um, 12 months time, we're going to move site and, and being able to talk really openly about how we get there and, and how that's going to look and feel. We've had good practice. And all of the last maybe two, three years of, of really being deep in the collaborative process has been um, practice for us. And now it's, it's, it's the main stage and, and this is why we have to get it right because we only get one opportunity to move site. We only get one opportunity to establish it and we need to do it in a way that's engaged for the long-term success of the business, but also about maintaining job security uh, transparency and openness through the process for our employees so that they end up in a really engaged uh, workforce and that they feel that they've been part of building and creating their own future. And that's how we can do it together is focusing on where are our common interests. But gosh, it's been a learning curve and, and we don't always get it right. <laughs> and as Mick has pointed out, you don't always agree. Correct. <laughs> but you, but as, uh, as Marcus said, you've got a framework for disagreement, which is a constructive framework. Yeah. And one of, the things, one of the things we talked a lot about is that it's healthy to disagree. It's healthy that we can have differences of opinion and that we know where to take that and how to resolve it. So 
so that it doesn't derail our progress. You know, we can acknowledge and say, we've got a difference of opinion. We're not going to agree here. Let's use the mechanism so that we don't devolve. Excellent. Thanks, Catherine. Um, so that we've got some time for the audience's questions, I'm just going to, if uh, you don't mind, Mick and Catherine, go to Opal. Um, and uh, Hassan, Matthew and Ray are, are each uh, involved at a site level. There are now nine or eight, depending on how you count them, uh, sites uh, in the Opal business. Uh, Ray, of course, as I mentioned, is in Reevesby. Uh, and Katrina mentioned quite openly some difficulties uh, that uh, just in the recent period uh, they have uh, been through. And that's why I said that I saw Ray yesterday morning, uh, in fact, some from 7 a.m. until 12 noon. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, and and so thanks for um, stumping up again this morning, Ray. And uh, Hassan and, uh, and Matthew uh, with the Brooklyn site um, are probably a different experience, um, much tech, not much uh, uh, investment in, in new equipment. Um, and with the Opal story uh, for the three of you, um, it's really been um, not so much one of um, long-term structural change as it is with news with the digitization, but just the, um, the constant uh, uh, external pressure of competition being an Australian, a solid Australian manufacturing company and manufacturing in Australia and dealing with your customers. You're in, a, in the FMCG supply chain because you make all the, the boxes that all of our goods uh, come to the supermarket in. And, uh, and so I'd, I'd just love to maybe start with Matthew from Brooklyn, just a little bit about what, what your experience has been, and then let's just get a, a word from Hassan and, and Ray and, and perhaps leave us in another 10 minutes or so, if that's okay with you guys, to um, take a few questions from the audience. So, Matthew. All right, thank, thanks, Anna. Can you, you guys hear me okay? I've been... We can. Excellent. So, yeah, no, we, I've been with uh, Opal, I've been in the industry for a fair while, but with Opal specifically for, for a bit over 18 months now. And even in that, um, in that time, we've been... Uh, on a journey, I guess, with the the um, change process and the collaboration model, and and it's similar to what Ray and the guys are experiencing up there. That um, what Ka Catherine mentioned that we don't always agree, and it's just I guess having that forum and that that trust is probably the key thing for me um, to to get us all that we all are in a common interest. We're all trying to 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 get the business better or the site better in this case our case and um, be moving forward that um, just because we don't agree doesn't mean it's not the right thing from either party so so we've been on a journey um, our site is probably one of the older sites and it's had a little bit of investment but it is a challenge when we've front up against some of the I mean just up the road there's probably the best uh, site in the world with our competitor so it is hard for us to to um, to keep up with them. So we've got to do things a little bit differently. So we've been on a journey in the last 18 months that I've been there and Huss has been a bit bit longer than me, but just to um, go through a bit of a process to get us back on track because we had um, sort of shifted away and get the trust back, I guess. So, so we've been working through working on the relationships and getting the team right and getting uh, uh, all of us aligned into what, what we were there to do. And to, and I think Mick, uh, touched on it a little bit about having those right forums, um, clearing out some of the IR um, sort of issues and, and be working on change um, and improvement uh, rather than dealing with some of the fires. So still dealing with them, but dealing through the, the right process. So um, the biggest thing I think we've learnt, um, and it's something that the team had learnt long before I was there and we'd, we'd lost, I guess, was that it's more than just a, a monthly review. So we and Hus can talk to it that we we have our monthly review and we minute that and we send out the, the agenda and the minutes and share that with the wider team, but we also meet um, to discuss the projects in between. So we've, we've focused on a few projects recently and we spend a lot of time within that month talking and working through that so that it's not just a, a management report back and, and we're all involved in, in working on improvement for the site and, and um, working on it together, I guess, rather than getting back once a month and, and listening to what we hadn't done, essentially, which is what was happening in the past or what we'd fallen into the trap of. So so what we've learned, I, I guess, over the, the last uh, six to 12 months is um, that it is an ongoing process and we do need to look a bit inwards at what we're doing, but also how we're doing it. And so we're at the point now that we did a big reset back in March and it's been working reasonably well, but we're still going to do a, 
a six month review because we were due to, to meet with the annual forum shortly. So we're going to still go through that review internally to say, yeah, we're, we're better, but what do we need to, to rejig, I guess, and uh, keep the path of improvement because we are getting some good gains. Thanks, Matthew. May I uh, may I ask Hass to? Uh, we just lost you on screen. At least I have Hass, but uh, if you can come back, that would be great. Um, uh, your deputy father of the chapel. It's an extraordinarily responsible role. It involves, uh, you know, on a not just daily basis but hourly basis, uh, being available to members. Um, what what is the reaction of the members uh, to uh, the, the process at Brooklyn? Uh, my name is Hassan. I joined uh, Aurora back then, Opal now, uh, in 2015. So uh, I was I was after the collaboration approach started and things were happening. Uh, uh, I became a union uh, delegate and deputy father of the chapel, and uh, I was part of the VCTs since I joined. And things, uh, as everyone said here, yeah, that doesn't we, we don't agree all the time. But I think the BCT is the right form to uh, to sort of find a solution, uh, a common ground where uh, we both, us as a union and the company, are working. Uh, our our aim is to be successful, and that's really important in my opinion. So uh, transparency and trust were are the basics of those meetings. And uh, back in February, I think we went for the delicate form in Sydney, and that's when we realized on the on site, like Matthew said, we we needed to refresh our committee. Uh, we came back, we set the rules, uh, the ground rules where uh, we're not gonna mix issues into the BCT, and uh, we committed to uh, sort of hold each other responsible and to work together for one aim, which is be able to improve and uh, be more efficient. And like Matthew said, we gotta be, uh, we got next door, we got a competitor who have a state of the art factory. So we had no solution without, beside working with each other. And as Katrina mentioned before, that the challenges were, uh, were the change in management. So a new site manager comes on site and then the whole thing, we have to go through the whole process all over again and explain things to them. And that's uh, that was the biggest, I think, uh, a challenge for us because uh, Brooklyn went through a few changes in the past three or four years, I think three or four site managers. And uh, the experience of the actual site manager also uh, is important. If the, if the actual site manager haven't worked in the industry it makes a difference. Uh, having Matthew on site and attending that actual meeting on the 24th of February <laughs> had us come back uh, into the meeting and we decided uh, that we weren't doing the right thing. We, we used to sit in a meeting and just bring up issues, leave the meeting, come back after a month and never work or speak about these issues. So we reformed that committee, we scheduled uh, a day of uh, every month, which is the last Tuesday of every month. And we put the agenda down and we said, that's what we're gonna speak about, 15 minutes for this, 15 minutes for that, 15 minutes for that. And then at the end of every meeting, we ask, uh, we ask ourselves five questions, which is uh, about uh, if things have improved, if things haven't improved, which is, we refer to the safety net, which is the uh, national, uh, national committee. Uh, help us resolve issue. And also there is uh, other question where we ask ourselves if we're having issues in those, in, in resolving any issues. And also uh, our, our committee at the moment does not only involve uh, union delegates. We, we decided to mix it up. So it's, it, it had the FOC and the deputy FOC and then it contains people from different working areas. So we got someone from the Karagaira, someone from the WIP, and someone from dispatch. Uh, uh, so we refreshed our members, so did the actual company. So the company doesn't have all their members at the moment. Like before we had the maintenance person, uh, 
as well in those meetings. So we decided only what needs to be uh, spoken about. So, so the actual people attending this meeting are different in every meeting. It depends on the issue. And we decided to work on different projects, which is working on at the moment. And we meet weekly for, uh, to work on this project. And there have been significant improvement in regard uh, to the project we're working on and as well as the performance of, of the machine. And I think that only reflects uh, to the trust and the transparency that's occurring at the moment on site and to the involvement of the people. Uh, that's about it. Well, thank you. Sorry, Hess. Thank, thank you so much. Um, Ray, uh, the, uh, the Reevesby plant, like every plant uh, of, in the Opal team, wants to improve its performance constantly in order to meet that competition. But just recently, um, there was some uh, really promising uh, work uh, that you've been doing uh, on site uh, with the corrugator machine, which uh, for, uh, for, for those in the audience is the, the heart of uh, any cardboard box making factory. It's what turns the paper into the uh, corrugated cardboard. Uh, and then it fell into, uh, in, into in, quite frankly, into, into a, a, a bit of an abyss uh, because of uh, some developments that occurred during the COVID period. So whilst the whole story might be too long to tell, you know, I think it's really important that you reflect upon your overall experience of collaboration, you know, the, the opportunities and the challenges, as Susan said, and just give us a couple of minutes on that so that we've got at least seven minutes now. <laughs> We're going to have less for the couple of questions that there are in the chat. Um, yeah, so I've been with the company since the Amcor days, um, coming up to 13 years now. And back then, obviously, I was just a, just a worker on the floor and worked my way through being a delegate and then now the, um, the FOC on, on site. Um, but, you know, during those early stages, the FOC and deputy before me had to had that hard emotional journey to try and get the people on board um, with this collaborative um, collaborative approach that um, Lorraine and Katrina had spoken to us about, had some very open and honest discussions on site with management and also with the floor. And um, look, we managed to not, not convince people, but you know, show them that you know, this is the best way forward for the, um, for the site and for the business itself. Um, and like what they did at Brooklyn um, that Hassan said, you know, it wasn't just going to be up to the delegates to get a lot of this through. Hence why at the time we decided, you know, you need to get a mixture of everybody together um, so that it's not just driven by, by delegates alone. Um, and like I said, it has been a very, very emotional challenge over the years. And I think in part, you know, we are here today talking about it now and that's shows the success of collaboration itself. Um, and even so that going from Amcor to Aurora and now Aurora to Opal, that transition to Opal, you know, a lot of our workers recognize that the sale to Nippon at such an extraordinary amount of over $1.7 billion to Nippon it, it is a sign that obviously all the work that we did beforehand has contributed into um, Aurora being able to sell the fibre division um, onto Nippon. But now, obviously, the journey doesn't finish. Um, th there are increasing pressures, obviously, from now from Nippon, because um, obviously they would want to make a, a worthy uh, return on their investment. And as such, obviously, with COVID in play as well, we are, we are faced with challenges that... Um, that we are starting to go through now. And as Anna and Katrina said, we did have a bit of an argumentative um, last three weeks where, yes, Anna has helped us with the IBP um, process, interest-based process, which um, I have gone through many times. And, you know, we've got new delegates that we are trying to, you know, get them involved with this process as well and, and changing our mindset into how we do a problem um, solve these problems on site and you know three weeks ago speaking for myself and because I was one of the people who did fall back into that old trap of um, delegate 101 where you know something uh, a problem comes up and then straight away we just put up the roadblocks um, 
and then it did lead to a disputation um, through our steering committee, not straight away to Anna, but um, myself did send it straight up to Katrina to have discussions with, and then Katrina and Chris um, did seek Anna's um, help. So now we're trying to get everything back on track. And I think well, the, the five hour meeting we did have yesterday um, was the starting point to try and, okay, let's get it back on track, you know, there are challenges that we are facing now because of COVID and um, look, we need to pull it all together and um, for the greater good of the site. Um, and now that also does lead to the challenges that us delegates do face because a lot of these changes may have impacts on people's, um, you know, take home income and every, and other things that may arise out of all this. But, um, you know, that's the challenge that we're, we're faced with and, and also for management to try and get an understanding that this is what we have to go through. You know, at the end of the day, our members come to us about problems and questions and stuff like that. They don't go directly to Chris. They don't go directly to management, so to speak. We are the, the people on the floor who, who take up these conversations with the guys and, um, you know, because obviously we're in a lot of all these meetings. So... It's a, it's a never ending journey and, you know, you, you might get to that next level and then, you know, something else will arise. So um, the collaboration has been really good on site and it's not without its own challenges. So, um, you yeah, know, look forward to continuing the journey, as, of course. So thank you. <laughs> that's great, Ray. Thanks. Hey, that's a very good way of introducing uh, Karen Zira's question, uh, which really goes, Karen's written three questions in the chat, but I think I can collapse them all into one, which is really who wants to try and answer this question. So first in best dressed, um, the time commitment, um, investment, investment in time, the investment in people, um, you know, what is it and, and can it really be justified? I'm happy to take it as a first go. Um, sure, Catherine. <laughs> here, here in Port Melbourne, um, we've been having a collaboration meeting once a week. That's an hour and a half every Thursday afternoon um, because clearly we've got quite a big project uh, under the really? that we're yeah. um, So, yeah, an hour and a half every week just in the meeting. And, and then, as you can appreciate, there's at least a couple of hours prior to the meeting in preparation and at least a couple of hours after the meeting in uh, writing up the minutes, distributing the minutes. Um, so just in a pure terms of, of attendance and, and, and meeting time, it, it, it's a fair amount. For a lot of our employees who are doing shift work as well, um, that's that's overtime payments or it's an extra shift payment, you know, so that there's a, a, a financial cost attached in addition to simply the time uh, that it takes. But categorically, it is worth it because you don't get the outcomes if everyone's not there. Um, and, and you can't put a cost on that. I mean, clearly you can. You, you can add up what it costs for us to meet each week. Um, but the, the greater outcomes that we're achieving uh, are allowing us to do things that we would never have got to uh, if we weren't investing. And, and yeah, every, every month when I see my overtime budget come through, it annoys me that it's all categorised to collaboration. But at the same time, I know that it is driving the outcome. <laughs> yeah. Right, thank you, Catherine. Does anyone else want to have a, a quick crack at that before I get to the next question? Yeah, I agree with what Catherine's saying. And just from our perspective, we have a half hour meeting before each collaboration meeting too, just so that we can get our ducks in a row and so that we don't end up becoming a rabble through the meeting. Yeah, and what about uh, the second part of the question for you, Mick? Is it worth it? Oh, it's been very much worth it because it's a very difficult process what we're all going through with the shifting of the premises but it's also helped a lot with the whole dealings with the coronavirus and it's also helped to deal with all this massive influx of work that um news corps got with the collapse of of fairfax or nine hey marcus <laughs> that influx is all you're doing <laughs> <laughs> That's called keeping the show on the road. <laughs> so it was a good opportunity for us. 
Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Mick, very much for that. I appreciate uh, that everyone's probably got an answer, but I'm going to go to the next question so we can uh, finish our session on time. Um, and that came from, uh, I saw one from, uh, from Sarah Ross, but I can't see that one now. So I'm going to move to Jenny Fraser. Um, if there's no union representation, uh, can, uh, can a collaborative approach work? Wow, well, it might be hard for the, uh, uh, that question to be answered because uh, everybody on the screen is, uh, is from a unionised company. But uh, what, do you, what are some, a quick answer from one of you. What's your view? There are companies uh, in Australia that uh, don't have uh, their workforce represented by a union. Can they be involved in collaboration? Can I just say one quick thing on this? Mm -hmm. um, I think it's a no coincidence that the joints which are badly organised have had coronavirus just r run rampant through a lot of their workplaces, whereas the joints which have been strongly unionised and the collaboration process with the company through the coronavirus, in my experience, has been able to keep the virus off the site. Interesting point, Mick. We could we could develop that. Um, I am quite sure, but we'll just ask the one more question so that everything that is least before me. And apologies if my my internet capability has uh, covered up anybody else's question. But from Sean de Souza, uh, a very specific question to uh, to the Opal delegates um, when feedback was provided on the running of the meetings um, by delegates. Was this feedback anonymous? Or, or did people make it um, openly? I was, I'll, I'll have a go at answering that, Anna, and Hus can probably add in. So there was probably a bit of both. Uh, we, we had to do a presentation in late February, early March, and so we did take feedback together and we shared that feedback, but there was also some closed doors stuff because there was just some discussions amongst the team. So we didn't want to be the managers deeming who should be in and out and uh, all that sort of stuff. So there was some some closed door discussions that I wasn't privy to, and it, and it came out with a with a result that was neither good or bad. It was their result though, so they they owned that. And it, so it wasn't like going around doing a survey. It was more just going to see, reflecting on our own performance and what we were doing well and what we were doing poorly. And then that got really solidified, I think, by seeing the other sites do the same process. And then we came back and all all did a thing to say, well, this is what we're doing well and poorly. This is what the other sites are doing well and poorly. What can we do, I guess? So it was, it was trying to be a more open discussion, I guess. Thank you. I was busy answering someone's chat there. This is fabulous technology, isn't it, when it works? You know, Sorry, you're talking, Anna. you're chatting. Go, Lorraine. Just, I did read Sarah's uh, question before Sarah Ross very quickly, and I hope, Sarah, I didn't get yeah, it Yeah, that's right. It was that's more good. Around the change in personnel, whether it's at management, delegates, et cetera, et cetera, how do we keep the positivity rolling, if you like? How do you keep the, how do you keep it moving um, and how do you keep it on track? I think that comes back to having to be prepared, as Matthew and, and the uh, team of Brooklyn have described, be prepared to stop and reset. And when new people come on board, take the time <coughs> to remember they're new, they don't just catch up with everybody and there's education provided to that, a bit of a history on where we've come, how we've come, and how the protocols work moving forward, and just a bit of transparency amongst each other if it's not working, to have the opportunity to just both parties reset, even if one party feels that it's needed and the other doesn't, just take that time to reset and get it right and move forward. So that would be my answer to what Sarah put forward before. Okay, great, Lorraine, thank you. Susan, would you like to come back and uh, close our session? Thanks, Anna. I was. Um, just about to do that. So thank everybody uh, for your attendance today. Just a reminder that um, the next session, you should use the link to the chat box. And uh, uh, I think we're now on a half an hour break before that happens. So again, can I just thank everybody for some really fantastic insights and such honesty. It's been, it's been really uh, uh, fascinating. And thanks for all everyone who's participated. I think